Hello, hello everybody and thank you so much for joining us today at this roundtable event which marks a significant milestone in our teaching assisting campaign. For discussion today, are school funding pressures putting the government's SEND review proposals at risk? Are school funding pressures putting the government's SEND review proposals at risk. To discuss this, we're bringing together a range of different perspectives to debate if school funding pressures are indeed putting those government send review proposals at risk. As part of the All I Do campaign to raise the profile of teaching assistants, our panel of experts, including an expert who's also going to give us a parent perspective, will be able to discuss this and look at this from many angles. So, whether you're joining us on the roundtable um, discussion today from within education or not, we hope to provide you with an insight, an insightful session, which will shine a light on the current challenges, but will also try and find some positives, some hopes. You know, the, the, these are passionate people that we've been engaged with and continue to engage with on our panel. So as well as looking at those challenges, looking at how these things have overcome have been overcome. So we do know when we think about the SEND review and we think about funding and pressures and that sort of delicate seesaw balance there, that the autumn statement delivered £2.3 billion extra funding for schools, equating to an average of £1,000 more for every pupil by 2025. Sounds like a lot of money. Yet this uplift will only restore in real terms funding to 2010. With the SEND review response now due in 2023, we want to understand if the government can keep its commitment to improving outcomes for children and young people with SEND and those in alternative provision. With the current fiscal situation, can we really achieve the, this ambition to provide the right support in the right place at the right time for those people who deserve it the most. As part of the All I Do campaign to champion the work of teaching assistants, NCFE has invited our leading experts today to voice perspectives upon this current situation and the role that teaching assistants can play. So let me introduce you to this esteemed panel. We have Trevor um, Cottrell, who is a senior lecturer in education and SEND, being the programme leader for the BA Honours Special Educational Needs and Disabilities degree at the University of Derby. Trevor, Trevor brings with him over 40 years experience across a range of educational contexts, including secondary, further and higher education. We are also joined by Lindy. Lindy Orchard is an early years professional, a SENDCO, a lecturer, a PhD candidate, and also will be able to bring the parent perspective. Lindy recognises the importance of children being positively supported throughout their educational journeys and their lives beyond to become successful adults. We're joined also by Abby. Abby has worked as a teaching assistant and later as a HLTA for over 20 years and has a degree in psychology and an MA in education. Abby, Abby established the Suffolk Teaching Assistant Network in 2020 and it's gone from strength to strength. This supports and promotes the work of teaching assistants across the county through a range of training and networking opportunities. We're also joined by Stuart. So Stuart Ginn is currently the head teacher of a Church of England primary school in Cornwall. He's worked in education for 20 years and is passionate about ensuring his school has a fantastic curriculum taught by well-trained and talented teaching staff. We also have Eva, Eva Cartwright. Now, Eva is a chief executive and co-founder of Platinum Training Consultancy, and Eva is currently having some technical difficulties, but will join us. And so I will keep uh, saying hello to Eva and reaching out. Eva leads a team of professionals delivering training in the UK, Middle East, Far East and Europe. 
She has a background as a primary teacher and early years professional and began her training career 20 years ago. So welcome everyone to our roundtable event. My name is Janet King. I'm the sector manager at NCFE for education and childcare, and I'll be chairing our discussion today. If you're listening today and wanting to get involved, and if you're looking at this as a recorded um, version, please do get, in, get involved and use our hashtag all I do. So opening up our debate and discussions and Lindy this one's going to be um, for you because I think it's really really important that we look at that the family view the parent perspective so before we get into the send review uh, in earnest I want to first start by see looking at that parent perspective and speaking to you Lindy so you've experienced at first hand the ways that teaching assistants have supported your own child. I wondered if you wouldn't mind just telling us a little bit about that positive experiences that you that you may have had, but also what you feel would or did indeed make the difference to improve the support that your child received. Thanks, Lindy. Thanks, Janet. Um, yes, my son. Um, is on the autistic spectrum, as Janet said, um, and throughout his life, he's had various challenges within education and having the right one to one support enabled him to be not just included within a class classroom, but properly integrated. It enabled him to engage with the curriculum and it, it enabled him to stay in mainstream education. Um, at various points throughout his primary school, it was discussed whether or not mainstream was the right route for him. But because he had well-trained, positive, inclusive teaching assistants working with him, he was actually able to remain in classrooms and stay within his peer group. Moving on from there, when he got to secondary school, once again, it was having that good, positive relationship with the staff where they understood his needs and understood him as an individual. Could they had the time to work with him on a one to one level and get to know him, get to know when he was maybe feeling anxious, when he needed a break from things. And by removing him briefly from a room just to chill down for a minute, and then they could bring him back in. He was able to actually complete his education through secondary school at a really good level. I mean, there have been times when it hasn't been 100% perfect. And those times were when people were off sick, when things had to change, which were beyond, um, you couldn't predict the changes. But the majority of the time, because his teaching assistants were given the space and the time to be with him, they were given the specialist training and that made so much extra help for him, giving teaching assistants time to learn things like Makaton, which through primary school he relied on to communicate, especially when he got stressed. It enabled him to be included properly within the class not just sat at a table in the corner which is where he started it actually enabled him to be properly integrated and properly included with all things um but as i say it's the idea of having my son entering a school now where he wouldn't necessarily get the one-to-one -one support he needed means i would be worried that he would end up being where he is now. He's now over 18 and because of the excellent support he received through school, through his teaching assistants, he's full time employed within an employer doing a job he loves and he's only able to be that adult he is now today, that independent human being, because he got such good quality support through the t his time in education. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Um, it's really good, isn't it, to be able, well, good's a strange word. It's really reassuring. It's it's really 
um, delightful, I suppose, to be able to hear such positive comments and to actually, if we think about that and reflect upon the significance of some of the things that, um, that you use. So just before we open that 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 up to the floor and, and Abby, I might come to you first to talk about the value that we that we need um, in, in teaching assistance and especially when we think about um, delivering that person-centered um, practice which which Lindy talked about there and then um, we will go uh, around the panel but some of the key words that I um, wrote down when you were talking Lindy person-centered practice obviously meeting your son's needs enabling was something that you um, you used quite a lot quality trained peers, relationships you used a lot um, and tuning into the needs of individual children was something that came through. So Abby, if we were to think about the value that teaching assistants bring through person-centred practice, what, what would you like to add to, to the conversation um, initiated there by Lindy? I think I would agree hugely with a lot of what was just said and I think it sort of demonstrates how when TAs are deployed effectively and trained to high levels, how effective they can be at helping integrate young people into classrooms and really ensure that they get that high quality teaching and they can access that effectively. And I think Lindy was sort of saying about how TAs are actually in a really unique position where they do have that little bit more time and I think time is a premium for everyone in in education but I think teaching assistants get that opportunity to really build that deep understanding of young people and their sort of their needs but also their strengths and actually can in the best circumstances be able to relay those to teachers and really ensure that planning is um is sort of delivered in a way that really supports all pupils in classrooms so I mean I I'm very passionate about teaching assistants so I would say they're really essential to schools but I think that just really demonstrates on a really personal level the impact long term into adulthood that actually that teaching assistant support can add to what the teachers obviously deliver in the classroom. Fantastic. Thank you, Abby. And you're dealing with teaching assistants, Stuart, on a daily basis. So would you um, sort of echo or challenge um, the, the conversation so far? Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting, isn't it? Because um, Lindy said about the, the relationships and, the, and the, how important that is. And we, we talk about in our school about the importance of relationships with children. Um, and that takes time, especially for, for teaching assistants working um, with children with with particular needs, um, and as we know, like you know, time and training and all that things that you know take take a, a financial implication on this on the school. Um, so you know, that's just it's, it's just sort of a massive thing. I think you know, RTAs really do support the most vulnerable, um, and I know this. You know, we we get teachers to to work with them as well, but obviously they they are the key people generally if you've got a child that has attachment disorder generally there will be a ta in the class who was one of those key people key key persons for that child and um you know to be able to sort of use your budget to to get them trained properly to give them time to work with that child is is is, is paramount really and and it worries me because we, you know, I, I would sort of run run my schools on on the on the premise that um, seventy five to eighty percent of the school's funding gets paid on on staff costs, and and that's pretty sort of uniform. Um, that that is becoming much much more and more difficult now um, with the sort of pressures and obviously the costs going up for for everything as well. Uh, and when you're looking at it in sort of financial um aspects which which i hate to do but you know as a head teacher you have to the the main way that you can make your make your sort of budgets balance is is by either increasing a class sizes or reducing your staff costs and and obviously neither of those you the you want to do and it, it becomes a it becomes a, a real sort of challenge so so when you're saying you know is it going to be a challenge yeah i mean the easy answer is yes and obviously 
with the children which are which is all coming through for us with with the covid disruption that we've had in in early years we've got a lot more sort of um, speech language uh, issues because they've missed chunks of nursery time and so we're trying to sort of throw everything at that and you need people to do that and you need highly skilled people to do that well trained people to talk to them uh, and to and to sort of use their skills skills to do that um and then I don't know I sound like I'm just moaning constantly don't I but the other thing the issue is for you so at my school at the moment we're, we're a school we've got just over 300 children I've got I, I actually need um uh, three extra one-to-one -one send TAs children that we've got top-up funding for um, and we ran the recruitment process in the last month and we got one application and it's not because we're we're, we're not a lovely school because we are people that work here love working here it's because when it, when I talk to people why they, they're not it's because they can get paid more going going to work at shifts at Asda or something like in supermarkets so we use we're losing these skilled people because they're they're working in unskilled jobs because we can only pay a a certain rate and it and it is something that is a constant worry and the, the sort of thing that keeps me up at night absolutely thank you Stuart and I think that really does sort of really give us an insight into the educational landscape at the moment and we'll move on further to talk about those implications about finance bringing together the the, the send review and how that might uh, further impact so thank you for, for that and um, just before we come to Trevor I'm just going to welcome Eva to the panel so hi Eva thank you for joining us today um, we are just um, looking at the parent perspective. So Lindy um, gave us a parent perspective there, Eva, and we're just looking at the importance of that person-centred approach that, that the teaching assistant brings. So Trevor, you're training teachers and assistants. And 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 you're you're on at five o'clock this evening. So when we think, when we think yeah. I know when we think about those teaching assistants then and how you're sort of preparing them for this, I, I guess, and they're coming from from the industry. A, a lot of your um, students, aren't they? So. Yeah. Yeah. person-centered practice, pupil-centered practice, child-centered practice, call it what you will. Is this something that is very much part of, um, you know, their, their remit? Yeah, I think it's really interesting um, because I, I'm really a, sort of trying to dispel the myth that when students come on our, our undergraduate course or on our foundation degree course, it's very much about their aspiration is to be a teacher. And actually, for a lot of these students, it's clearly not. It's about they have a passion. I always say to our students, if you've got an interest in SEND, don't come on our course. Yeah, you've got to have a passion for it because you're going to be eating, living, breathing SEND for the three years of the undergraduate and also on our postgraduate course and our foundation degree course. So if you've just got interest, go elsewhere, go and do another course which has some SEND modules. And that's, that's my remit. And I think also is the idea of dispelling the myth that you know, teaching assistants are there just to assist. They're not. They are, you know, they are professionals in their own right. And what I say to our students is, you know, you bring in so much expertise and value. So we are at very odds to make sure that when, when I'm working with these um, TAs who are, as you say, practitioners, they are working with our undergraduate students. Now, our undergraduate students will be understanding the modules around getting the degree but also the teaching assistants and bring in their expertise and that relationship between the two has been really fundamental in our understanding of teachers is and i always say to, to when when we are we are interviewing students is what are you wanting to do on the course and quite often they will say to me okay I have the practice, I am in a school, I'm in a special school, or I may be in a mainstream school, or I'm in a college, so I understand what's going off in the classroom, but what I want to do is I want to have the background knowledge, the background understanding, so I can then go and challenge people within our organisation or whatever, say, you know what, there's a reason for that, there's a reason for that, and have you tried that, that kind of a process? So I think that it's really important that they are able to take the academic focus, which is my remit as an academic, 
but also allow that to match into their professional and their career within the classroom situation. And when it works, it works really, really well. And what I did, I've written two foundation degrees and two um, honours degrees in SEND. And at the heart of all this is being practice, impact and research. And why should not teaching assistants have access to practice, impact and research? Because they are still going to be working with people, especially now when things like quality first teaching comes into it, they've got a bigger role to play working alongside teachers. So I think one thing that we really stress is that, you know, it's it's a myth that every teacher and assistant on the course is wanting to be a teacher. No, but they're not, because quite a lot of teaching assistants aspire to be the best teaching assistant they are. And it's my job to keep that inspiration going, but just add perhaps a little bit of, you know, research evidence, academic focus. So they are the experts in their own field. Fantastic. That's really enlightening. And, and it's really good to hear. You keep using the word good, but it's a really positive affirmation of the of the value that we've we've talked about so far and the professional um, status of the teaching assistant. So thank you, Trevor. Um, Eva, are you OK to to come in and, and just sort of from your perspective, that importance of of, of, of being person centred, what that teaching assistant brings to those individual children? children um, and the significance of person-centred practice. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Janet. And apologies for my tech issues at the beginning. No, not at all. Really interesting uh, hearing Stuart's perspective as a head teacher, because I think you're seeing so much of the, the importance of getting this right and also Trevor's perspective. And um, I think you, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there that so many people want to do this role as a career um, and it isn't that you know, most most of the TAs that, that we come across do not want to go anywhere near teaching yeah. they really are treating being a TA as their career um, and as such it is such a person dynamic and as you were just asking there Janet I think without TAs feeling as if they're part of the whole school team without them feeling valued in being included in a range of different training, getting them involved in thinking about every little element of their role, but also that um, that their their well-being is looked after too. So they're torn in so many directions, and if they feel that then their well-being isn't at the centre of the school, um, then they will walk. And I realise I've just looked at Karina's comments in the um, in the chat there and. I realise that, uh, and you touched on this as well, Stuart, pay. Um, unless they're paid properly, they don't feel valued. But if we can't pay them as much as we would like to pay, people stay in a job because they feel tremendously valued and because we're looking at their well-being as much as we can look at their pay. Um, so I do wonder if reviewing that side of um, things might might help. But yeah, you're quite right, Janet, in that if we don't um, look at how the TAs can build positive relationships with the children that they're working with, if they're not at the centre of those relationships, if they're not able to fully understand a child's needs and aren't included in every single element of putting together um, the strategic plan for that child, then they feel missed out of the loop um, and can't do their job to, to their full extent. Yeah. And they do want to be professional, as Trevor was saying, you know, they really want to be professionals in that field. They want to they want to make that impact. They want to be those reflective practitioners as long as they're taught how. Does that answer your question enough, John? Was that the answer no, you were hoping for? Yeah, no, that that's absolutely fantastic. And I think all the contributions so far are just making up this this wonderful um sort of understanding in, in terms of the teaching assistants and and what they do and the idea, Trevor, that teaching assistants don't just assist is is actually quite <laughs> profound, isn't it? The more you think about that, yeah. and, yeah. and 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 at that point, Angie, I don't know whether there's anything that you would like to add to to summarise and to bring this this part of the debate to a close. Well, first of all, thank you for everybody's contribution, because I think we all come from various different backgrounds, and I think it's really good to have that perspective. 
um, on this. And, and I think um, for, for me, it was uh, during a recent interview where uh, a TA actually spoke about being the glue that holds the school together. And I think from what everybody's <laughs> just said, it, it's absolutely right. You know, they are the backbone of the school and without them, the school could not possibly function. Um, and, and, and it's really challenging what they're up against because you're absolutely right. They have got that passion and commitment. That is why they do the job. Let's face it, we, we wouldn't have any TAs if it, was, if it was just about the money. They do it because they absolutely are passionate about what they do. Um, and the number of teaching assistants has actually trebled since, um, you know, 2000. So, you know, they want to be in this role because they want to support the children. So I think, you know, this growing prevalence and, and reputation of TA workforce is therefore should be at the centre of schools inclusion, really, um, because they are at the heart of, of, of delivering uh, and supporting the children and families needs. So, yeah, so I think that's that that's that's where we are with that. Lovely, thank you. OK, so we now know and understand and appreciate and value the significance of that teaching assistant and the prof professionalisation that they are bringing to the sector. Let's look at things perhaps from a different angle. And, and, and Stuart, I'm going to I'm going to come back to you because you started to to talk to us there and gave us a really meaningful insight into into budgets and how it's difficult to be able to balance that sort of child-centred, ch children and young person-centred practice with the budget and the challenges from a financial implication when things when things are a challenge. So what do you think the impact of that can be on the children? You know, ha have you are you able to 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 talk about that a little bit and how you manage to get that balance right so that you don't feel that those children that that deserve the um, the, the teaching assistant interventions and so on are disadvantaged in any way? Or do you think that actually sometimes they they are? Well, I mean, it's it, interesting. Trevor was was talking about you know quality first teaching, so we base this everything on that. And 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 Angie sort of touched on this as well. So, you know, teaching assistants are an integral part of that. Um, and when you're looking at interventions, which are things which we which we need extra for 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 particular pupils of ours, yes, it, it is it is really difficult to get them in. I the only it's it's a massive budget headache. The only thing which I think is helping us to survive at the moment is going back to that. People sort of saying that TAs are passionate about being in the system and and being in education and making a difference. To be honest, we are we are relying on their goodwill and flexibility to be able to sort of one minute be working with one child and then all of a sudden do it. They they don't have any respite at all. I mean, you know, t obviously teachers are the same, but it, TAs even less so because there's such a valuable resource that that we sort of timetable them as best we can. Um, and, you know, we can only use a little bit of sort of like the COVID catch up money to be able to sort of do that. Um, and we yeah, to, to mainly spend spend most of our time sort of looking at ways that we can just get that extra five, 10, 15 minutes anywhere that we can just for those sort of shorts interventions. And, you know, I have teaching assistants that that in the afternoons are sort of running around collecting children, going off to children, going into their class and supporting them in the class as well as doing the, the doing extra interventions. Um, I'm not sure for how long we can keep that up. In all honesty. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart, for that very, very honest um, reflection on, on how things can be. Abby, if I may, you're representing um, the, um, the, the the network, the, the Suffolk net, network. Do you hear these sorts of implications around um, sort of the, the funding, the resources, you know, the way that, that finance is impacting the, the quality of, of provision? And how do you sort of make sure that those teaching assistants are able 
or how do they not give you the responsibility? How do they try and overcome those sorts of concerns to be able to make sure they do the best they possibly can? Um, it's a big, so big think, question. <laughs> you no, know, that's fine. Um, obviously, our network was quite unique when we set it up. There have been subsequent networks that have been set up in different counties. We've now got a membership of over sort of 430 TAs across Suffolk. Um, so I sort of hear the perspective of a number of different teaching assistants. And I think I think finances are very stretched and I think time is very stretched. But I think our TAs that I come across are so passionate. They're so willing to sort of give their time for for the young people that they support. And I think are really highly skilled and actually often have knowledge and understanding in some areas that some of the other staff in schools don't have, whereas the other staff have their own sort of levels of skills. But actually, I see it work really effectively where teaching assistants have those specialisms and actually deliver training to other staff within their settings um, and share that expertise. And I think building that confidence um, really empowers teaching assistants and actually can make them feel so much more valued and sort of incorporated into the into sort of the whole school system. But I think also our network has almost tapped into a sort of a unique way of, of helping support delivering some of this CPD to teaching assistants in maybe a more cost effective, um, time effective manner. And I think we really look at the needs of teaching assistants across the county and try and work collaboratively with local organisations, national organisations to really deliver training to sort of large numbers of TAs at a variety of time slots to try and make that really accessible for staff so that schools don't have so many barriers for being able to upskill their TAs to be able to do the work that they do in schools really effectively. So I, I sort of I champion it as a model sort of it, it works really nicely. And I think it's something I would love to see across every county of the country. And I know it's something that counties are really keen to do. And obviously this year I've received funding from our local county council um, to fund the work that I'm doing with teaching assistants. So there's sort of there is, I think, the, the appetite out there across the country for these sort of networks and this support to really ensure we can add to the professional skill set that teaching assistants have and and just sort of really increase the opportunities to have that professional experience. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that insight to the work that you do. So we've 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 heard the parent perspective. We've taken a deeper dive into the school leader perspective. So now, Stuart, I'm going. I'm sorry, Trevor. I'm looking at Stuart. Trevor. Uh, <laughs> sure, we can go so, again. <laughs> apologies. So, Trevor, if I can come to you and we'll yeah. look at that sort of academic perspective, yeah. if you like. So, building on what, what, what Stuart and Abby have, have told us there and what we've heard from Lindy so far, how does the current educational landscape impact the role of the teaching assistant, do you think? If we take into consideration the main role, the implications of meeting the intentions of the SEND review and the individual outcomes, significantly those individual outcomes for children and young people and their future aspirations, which thankfully Lindy gave us a little bit of hope um, when, when she spoke about her own experiences. OK, thank you, Jen. Yeah, I think it's interesting listening to everybody. And obviously, I'm not in the position of being in the teaching set or in a school. I'm in the, the ivory tower of university. Um, and obviously, one of my areas is to research what's going on. So that's what I've done. I've done a lot of research for our students around the role of TAs and the impact that the new SEND reforms might have on that. But also look at this idea, well, actually, quite often, we focus on why teaching assistants are being recruited and why they're leaving and why i spoke to somebody today actually they were saying the colleague there's gone to work at at, um, at the uh, the airport down the road packing amazon crates because they get 15 pound an hour 
And I think there's a lot of that going on. Just, just, but I think, and also the idea of, you know, the penny for the guy type thing that we go around cap in hand, we need more money, we need to do, we need to be, be more cost effective. So I think money is quite an important area. And the idea that the, the problem is trying to recruit TAs and also to retain TAs. But I think we can't, not, we, we have to keep our eye on the ball that we have some absolutely brilliant TAs and they are passionate for doing their job and they would walk over glass to still do that job. And I think TAs, we tend within the press to get this negative focus. We can't recruit, we can't recruit, et cetera, et cetera. But I just want to say that, that what I do with our students is really boost that, not only the academic, but the professional status of those those teachers, uh, teaching assistants who remain. So I just, so I just want to give you a few of my ideas Okay, and, and give you some sort of findings from research. And then there are some issues with this, um, as you would expect. <laughs> but it's interesting that, that when we are doing this with our students, we are using this as debate. So we are debating the role, we're debating the issues. And I think, I think the, th the key point is that we all agree that that is going to be the descent vote are going to be totally underfunded. I think that that's the crucial bit. OK, and that extra 780 million five funding is in the direction, but it's only half what we need. That that's the, the key point. And I think the other thing is if you go back to look at the, the green paper, then it talks about um, it's only one little aspect where TAs are mentioned, and that's in the idea that that schools should be advised on how to deploy them effectively. Yeah, and that, that's it. Um, what does that mean? You know, why can't schools actually be put in the position that they are the experts and why should they be advised? Why? And I think a lot of this thing is about this downward trickle, this idea well, somebody will tell people what to do. And I think the other boys is actually, why not, why not just think out the box? Why not just let schools manage that money and manage that resource more effectively? That, you know, so you listen to the Labour Party conference yesterday. That's what they were saying. It's about devolving the the issue. So I think I think there is an issue around around funding, and I think the the area is interesting. So if we take that that area of funding, what do schools do? So there's a number of things that they can do. One is they could the the, the National Audit uh, Office recently have given it some suggestion that some schools may be less likely to admit or keep people as schools with send because it's costly. OK, and Stuart mentioned the idea that there is a cost effective and, it, you know, it's, you know, I don't envy his job whatsoever in trying to balance the books and working from that. You know, that £6,000 per student with SEN, you know, yeah, well, that will pay for 12 hours of TA support. But is that the most effective way of using that? So there is all that sort of, it's not just a clear case of more funding, it's what happens with that, that funding. Okay, I think the other thing that, that comes up is, is that we've got the numbers increasing. So that that's what goes without saying. So if we take things like, we take students, there's, there's 470, over 473,000 students and pupils with an EHC plan. That's, that's a real increase. OK, that's over 62,000 new HCHC plans than last year. It's It's got to be costed. It's got to be costed. OK. And so basically, if we take that 4% rise and we, if we keep that 4% rise and 4% rise and 4% rise, it, somewhere it's going to be untenable. OK, so we're chasing we quite rightly are saying we need EXC plans, we need SEND support or whatever we need to do. But if we continue with this rise in that additional numbers, then the additional funding has to come through. So I think there's, there's one there's one particular issue around funding. OK, I think there's another issue around and we've, we've, we've touched on this is about a, a, having a proper professional development structure. We talk about a career. OK, but quite often it's the teaching assistant who may go on a CPD away day or it might be, well, if we've got time, we'll put a we'll give some support for the teaching assistant in terms of how that works. But again, it's 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 piecemeal. It's piecemeal. It's not it's not cost. It's costed in goodwill. OK, and it's costed with actually, will you stay behind to do this? 
So what's happening is that we're saying that we need a professional development structure, but we're not paying for it. We being the general society, okay? And it does rest on 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 good, on good, um, good position. And I think the other thing is, and we talked about this, is what what are the teachers' perspectives of teaching assistants, okay? I think that's that's the other thing that we we are talking about. I always say to our students that. Every teacher is a teacher of send, which is obviously because that's from. The, but I always say every TA is a T is a TA of send. That's that's the key point. You don't have to be working in a special school. You, you can be working with you know or what, you don't even have to be working with one to one. You can be working with a group of students. And so it's important to say. And I think there needs to be some discussion between the role of TAs and the role of teachers. So it doesn't become, well, you can work with that learner, you can work with that learner, you can do that. Because all the research suggests that some learners actually find that beneficial. OK, and, and indeed, some parents find that beneficial. The fact is that my, my, my child has to actually get extra support. But it's interesting that sometimes is when we when we research the children's perspectives of TAs, that comes out as very positive. They say they're very useful and they're very helpful. OK, but when we look at parents, interestingly, parents, some parents will say they're very useful. I couldn't, my child could not, like Linda was saying, you know, it's that superb teaching assistant who works with that one to one relationship. But equally, some parents say, well, actually, what happens is that my child is being isolated, in inverted commas, you know, and the fact that we talk about personalization, we talk about person centered planning, we have the hours, but you know, they're missing out the classroom approach. We're missing out that process. So I think there's a whole area that needs some picking in the relationship between TAs and teachers. So you can't look at teaching assistants role and professional development without removing the role of parents and the role of teachers themselves, that, that kind of relationship. And often I did some research is that we, I find that some teaching assistants say, well, actually, I spend more time on managing behaviour and I spend more time on working out, you know, in terms of caring process, taking the, the, the in person to the toilet, changing them, et cetera, et cetera, feeding them that kind of process. And it's detracting from my job. So I'm almost being a healthcare assistant. So it's back to this. What is the role of a teaching assistant? And I think that needs to be unpicked because there is no one single role of teaching this. You can, you can have any, as many as you want. OK, but I think it's also about that kind of support. And I think the other bit is about. <laughs> we're talking about getting a. A role that the teaching assistant fulfills, but also we're talking about financially supporting that teaching assistant. But we also need to look at supporting them as a professional and not a paraprofessional, as a professional. And that how as that happens to happen. And I think there are there. Are, I think what we need to do is we need to think out of the box. Um, and what I'll do at the end when we've got one minute to sum up, I'll give you my my thoughts <laughs> about what, what we do. I, you know, I'm, I'm not working but it, in that area, but I think you know, I am so passionate about this. Uh, about how it seems to be but it is almost like a pandora's box when you mm -hmm. open it up out throws everything yeah? yeah and the ability then is to put everything back in the pandora's box and that's not solving anything mm -hmm. so i think there's issues around pay and support and career development i think there's issues around funding and what staff or teachers do with that money okay i think there's issues around um, parity of professionalism between teachers and teaching assistants and that relationship and I think there's also the idea importance about how do parents and how do children perceive the role of teaching assistants. Very insightful Trevor thank you very thank much you. Um, I've noticed that Abby you would you like oh, to sorry. bring something no it's fine it's great would you like to bring something in on re regarding anything that you've heard in this part of the debate? I was just going to comment on what Trevor was saying about that importance of that collaborative working relationship between teaching assistants and teachers and actually the interesting fact that actually a lot of teachers feel like they maybe lack the skills and the confidence to effectively deploy TAs in the classroom and actually there's a training yeah. need I think on both sides of the coin yeah, I think so. there isn't enough in 
teacher training around deploying adults effectively and actually it has to be sort of a confidence and skill level amongst both professionals yeah. to be able to have that effective working relationship and I think that's when you get really really good practice in a classroom yeah. is when that works really effectively. Yeah. I work a lot with teacher training students and the idea of the, one of the areas that I will go and work with them is how do they work with teaching assistants? So that it's not always, well, actually you're the teaching assistant, you take ownership of that kid, but it's actually how, what, what can teachers learn from teaching assistants and how do they work together? So when I go into our new teacher training students, I'll say, okay, how are you going to work with your teaching assistant? Oh, well, they can, no, 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 no. No, how are you going to work with your teaching assistant? <laughs> okay. It would be useful to get to know them, isn't it? And then I think we're talking about person-centred planning with the students, but what about person-centred planning relationships with the teaching assistant? So I mm. think, Abby, you're right. It's that it's that synergy between the teachers and the, the and the fact is that there is that relationship that is about mutual respect and mutual development of professionalism. But yeah, it really shocks them when I say, you know, how are you, you going to work with your teaching assistant? Mm. <laughs> no, I, I, absolutely. Thank you. And thank you, Abby. Uh, Lindy, please do bring your contributions. There we go. Um, I just want to say, yes, 100%. And it's the, I've been to parents' evenings where the teaching assistant was in the room with us and they sat down with us because actually the teaching assistant was enabled to put their input onto my son's original statement and then ECHP. And so it was actually valuing them. And I was really lucky my son's primary school was in a position to do that. I mean, I'll be brutally honest, I'm hearing talk about funding and talking about the financial aspect of this. And it makes me feel quite cold as a parent to think that if my son hadn't had that one to one support, that high quality teaching assist mm. or those high quality teaching assistants supporting him through primary and then less at secondary school, but still at secondary school. I really do not think he'll be in the position he is today. And right now, today, he is contributing fully as an adult to society. Mm. But that is only because he had such good quality interventions mm. and they weren't so I know you're talking about the 15 minutes here and there, which is what you're required to do nowadays to try and get the best out of your teaching assistants. He had 20 hours a week mm. what, to start mm. off with, and mm. that was uh, reduced as he no longer needed it. But to sit there and think that he comes down to a financial figure yeah. is quite scary. Mm. Well, I think you're right. I think Stuart picked up that. You know, the, the, the heads have to balance the books. They have to do that kind of thing. You know, your six thousand pounds from your budget would pay for something like twelve hours of a teaching assistant. Yeah, and it's it, it's about it, it, it is a cost, and it's about what what price do we put that cost onto it? And I think that's something we have to to look as a society and as an educational organisation to see what price do we put that one to one that support that knowledge within that process and of course with that ever increasing demand you yeah. did talk about the, the, you know that yeah. massive yeah. increase yeah. yeah and if that if that continues year on year Eva can I can I bring you bring you in because um as an experienced teacher who I, I know um, sincerely values the role of the teaching assistant but when when Trevor was talking there about the importance of that relationship and the significance of just the simple things, you know, getting on with each other and, and therefore being able to to work together in a meaningful way. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, that is more than um, it, it brings so much more, doesn't it? If you've got that sort of um, expertise and you've got that respect I think that's just a simple word that I'm searching for that respect for each other and that appreciation of what of what the the other will bring have you seen how that can work well and how maybe sometimes it doesn't yeah absolutely completely both sides and ultimately it comes from um, an expectation of the school that they expect their teachers predominantly and I think Abby you hit hit a really strong point there that it comes from teachers wanting to know how to work with TAs effectively wanting to embed that really good practice showing the TA respect the TA obviously then um, respect in return um, but ultimately 
I think one of the things that um, I always say to TAs um, and teachers when, when I'm delivering training is that if I was an inspector walking into your classroom, I would not want to be able to tell who's the teacher and who's the TA. And it's not because I'm looking at sharing ultimate overall responsibility, it's because I want to see the same strategies, the same teaching and learning strategies, the same um, expectation, high quality relationships with the children, the same language and terminology, the same ultimately consistency so that um, just to use some of Paul Dick's information about you know, the value of every single element of a school being consistent to a certain extent so that every child in that school understands full expectations. Fantastic, you've got everybody on board then. Um, but yes, Jenna, I've seen um, great teacher TA relationships and I've seen really, really dreadful ones. And it all really stems from not spending time together, not having an expectation that everybody values each other, that there's a weird hierarchy kind of system going on. Um, I've even seen schools where teacher teaching assistants weren't allowed in the teacher staff room. I, you know, if we if we're not all just people at base level, then how are people like Lindy ever going to get what they need for their children? I'm also a parent of two children with dyslexia who have now made it through the education system into adulthood. And I'm just breathing a sigh of relief because, again, from Lindy's perspective, it, it's how do we how do we achieve this for our children when there's so many obstacles? Um, it's, it's quite upset. I'm sorry, Abigail, you've got your hand up there if you'd like to contribute. I was Thank just you. going to say I think um, what you were saying really highlights the need for teaching assistants where possible to be part of whole school CPD alongside teachers and I think that because of a variety of funding and contractual issues often is quite difficult to achieve and I think when that works well you develop that common language and sort of the common CPD um, themes that are happening in a school, if both teachers and teaching assistants get to develop those and learn those together, that allows that consistent practice in the classroom. And I think that that's really important that 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 can happen where possible and that it's relevant for both teachers and teaching assistants. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you. Great insights. And we've looked at this now, uh, you know, from many perspectives. Stuart, please, please do come in with your contributions. What do you think as a school leader? Well, I just yeah, I just wanted to sort of say say with that um, on the back of what Abigail said. So, you know, we we can't afford to pay um, teaching assistants extra to stay behind for extra CPD. So we try and find ways around that, and and one of those ways is, which we find really useful, is uh, we being a church school, we have a daily collective worship. Um, uh, which sort of takes about 15 to sort of 20 minutes by the time they get in and out of the hall and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we we factor that in so that um, a member of SLT or one of the teaching team will will have a half hour sort of training session or, or um, teaching assistant meeting. Um, but it always feels it's a bit rushed, right? We've got half an hour to do to, to just as quickly do something. But it's better than nothing. Um, uh, but, you know, thankfully the teachers, are, you know, are all, all on board, so they make sure that you do all the collective worship and then they go and sort of teach in their class sort of for 15 minutes after that so that we get a good sort of full half hour. But it always just feels like we're borrowing Peter to pay Paul just to get in whatever training we can. Mm, thank you. Balancing the books, as, as, yeah. as Trevor said, very, very difficult. Um, Trevor? Yeah, so as it's interesting talking about when I think it was you were saying when you go into a classroom, you shouldn't know who's the TA and who's the, the teaching. But I think there's something very fundamental about roles and responsibilities. And I think that's the problem because quite often teaching us is a scene, it's never any piece of string, right? Can you do this and can you do that? Can you do that? Can you do that? And because they've got the individual child or the group in, in mind, they will quite often do that. But I think it's interesting. When I've been in and worked with, there's there's sometimes there's sometimes like a power play between you know I am the teacher, I am the qualified person, 
yeah? I have a degree, I have a teaching qualification. And I'm not saying that's across the board, but I have seen that in a number of situations. And so I think what we have to look at is that what gets in the way is personalities. And you bring your personality as a teaching assistant or as a teacher to the forefront. And I think so it's very much about roles and responsibilities and making sure they're clear and, and demarcated in the sense, but they're flexible, but also that teaching assistants are not this never this ever ending piece of string where they can just add more and more and more to it. But I do think one of the issues very much that I work on with our students is looking at the power relationships within classrooms and say, you know, you have a right, yeah? You you have your knowledge, you have that. My job is to give them that knowledge so they can challenge. And mm. so, you know, there's a reason why, you know, one student said, they went into to a class and said, what, what, why is that child over there on his own? Because he's got autism. Okay, so why is he, why is he on his own? He can't join in groups, because I know these things. Excuse me. <laughs> and that's <laughs> the thing that I'm trying to get our students as a challenge and give that authority through. But I mean, I think that's it. So it really is about the personalities that they bring. And when this personality working in harmony, they're great. But it's also about roles and responsibilities and not assuming that the teaching assistant is everything that you know the teacher doesn't want to do. But I also think it's very much sometimes in terms of a power relationship. Mm, interesting, very interesting. Angie, before we move on to look at the, the send review and sort of shift things over to, to looking at the implications of that for the role of the TA, is there anything you would like to bring, um, you know, regarding your own experience, for example, um, in, in the role of a, a teaching assistant, thinking about the things we've heard today? Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and I agree with everybody's got, you know, absolutely superb sort of comments to make. And I think Eva, you, you touched on that point of, of, of really sort of working together. And it's that teamwork that I've seen personally that actually shows how, how it can actually work in practice. If you've got two people that are working on the same page with placing that child at the center of everything, then then it's a wonderful teamwork and I think and I know it's a challenge for schools um Stuart I, I totally understand that it, it's it's working together as well to make sure that they the time is given but when you have that wonderful teamwork and, and I think it goes back to that as well with understanding roles and responsibilities like you said Trevor going back to that training if everybody understands those roles but coming together and working in harmony together collaboratively but always making sure that you're putting that child at the centre of everything that we do, then that's a match made in heaven, isn't it, really? So I think like like the uh, review states, you know, it, it's it's the right support um, is at the the right place at the right time. So if we if we can just harness all of that, um, then then that that's what we need. That is what we want. That is what we can do. We can achieve it. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. And thank you to everybody for your comments so far. So if we think now about that send review and, and about delivering the promises of the send review um, and the, the, the expectations of that, we need to ensure that we do have the skills that we've talked about today um, within, within our school settings. So we're going to think now about this, that skill set and what are actually those key requirements of teaching assistants? I'm, I'm going to come to you, Eva, with this one in mind. What are the skill sets that we, that we need our teaching assistants to have to make sure that we are providing an environment where children and young people can, can thrive as they should, you know, with those aspirations for the future? Yeah, I think everybody's touched on this today about the relationships with the children, the knowledge of the children, really, really understanding every single child um, that, that they need to focus on. And I'm sure, Lindy, the TAs that have stood out to you as a mum have been the ones who've really got to know your child, who's really got to know their needs, their likes, dislikes, and, and how to really get those breakthroughs um, with, with your son. Um, without having that willingness to really get to know the children, where, where else can, can they go? But um, certainly the professionalism that, that we've talked about today, 
big and um, the willingness to want to learn, to want to be reflective, to want to be part of the team, to want to break down those hierarchical systems. You know, as Trevor said, when they can see something awful happening, like a child being segregated, um, that they've got that strength of character to stand up to that and make sure that they know that they've got a place in changing and improving education for the better. Um, as well as all those other um, skills of how to inspire children during a learning activity, how to make something really exciting, how to promote confidence, independence, motivation, curiosity, all those lovely things that, that we really want our, our TAs to do. And I think that's why it's when you get a TA who's absolutely all of these things and then you see them going to work for, was it Amazon that you said, Stuart? Where were they going? Yeah, Asda, yeah. DHL, yeah, Stuart, yeah. yeah. That's right. And you see Amazon, yeah. so awesome going off to work for, for just a tiny bit more money that we can't compete with. Um, then it, it is heartbreaking to see the, these people lost within the system um, because mm. that, that magic of a TA's personality can't be just simply trained. They've, they've got to have that, that real will to be a high quality TA, to be the best that they can be. Fantastic, thank you. And Lindy, I'm going to, to bring you in if I may, just thinking about what Eve has said there um, and, and about those skills. Is there, if you had a magic wand, if you had a magic one, what what skills get set would you describe? What would you what, what would be in your toolkit for, for the ideal TA? I'd say the most important thing would be communication. The ability to communicate with the child at their level, in their language, whatever that happens to be, however they communicate, with the parent, so that the feedback, especially if you've got a child with significant additional needs, mum suddenly gets all the parents suddenly get disconnected when the child's at school and having something to keep that communication going at home is important and also being able to, to communicate as we've said with the teacher in the classroom to feed back and to make sure that the child's individual needs are represented within the classroom and not just as we've said put on the table in the corner um, so that would be my top thing is communication skills because everything else comes from that. If you can mm. listen and communicate, you can get the information you need from um, courses like Trevor's. You know, you can pick up the skills you need beyond that. But if you can't communicate, I think that's where yeah. a lot of frustrations come from. Yeah. So it's, that's where I'm going to leave it. Yeah. No, that no, that's great. Can I open that up to anybody else on on the panel in terms of those significant skills that we would, you know, we, we would really hope that a, a teaching assistant um, would have or would need to be able to have a toolkit that that gives them the resilience they need to be um, that professional. I think Lindy's sort of summed that up, you know, really nicely about the communication because because it is at the centre of everything. If you think of what, a t you know, a TA has to communicate really well with the child, the parent and the teacher. And once that triangulation is all in place, then you you see that happen. Um, and then we touched on it earlier. I think Trevor sort of said, they just need to be passionate about education and have these high expectations of, of children who are either vulnerable or, or do have particular needs, but actually think I can, I can make a difference here and and when we recruit that's what we always look for we we have like you know we just do sort of like general observations the main thing that gets the, the TA the job is how they interact with children just for you can see it in five or ten minutes I think fantastic thank you Abby would you would you agree that these are the sorts of things that you that your um that your network has in their toolkit or that they hope to tune into? I think definitely, I think communication is really key. But I also think um, I am licensed to deliver the Maximise and Practice of Teaching Assistance course around sort of independent learning and trying to sort of um, develop independent learning skills um, through teaching assistant practice. And I think teaching assistants also need that skill, those skills and the knowledge that actually sometimes 
you need to strategically step back and observe and actually bring in that support only when it's needed. And I think sometimes there's maybe a fear amongst teaching assistants that actually I need to get in there and I need to be doing and helping and supporting all the time. And although that that's really lovely and that passion is there actually sometimes that can lead to sort of the situation that Trevor was talking about around actually that over supporting and and then those children becoming less independent sort of more isolated from their peers from the teacher and I think that's really really crucial that 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 comes into that training and I would also say just the confidence actually funnily enough when we first set up the network one of the biggest training needs our teaching assistants identified for themselves was confidence and we actually had some bespoke confidence training put on because actually having our teaching assistants feel empowered that they do have the skills and the knowledge to contribute and actually sort of say right I, I think this needs to be put in place and have those professional conversations and I think recognizing themselves as those professionals I think sometimes teachers recognize them as professionals they almost don't have the confidence to recognize themselves as professionals and I think that's really important thank you that's really interesting and of course a lot of what Trevor is doing is raising that and raising that professional status and and, and, and enabling through that confidence so that's fantastic Wow, what a fantastic debate we've had and, and a really, really insightful discussion looking at this, um, the, the role and the significance of the TA from many different perspectives and looking at the implications and what actually is going to unbalance that seesaw and why we need to keep it balanced for the sake of the children and the young people who, who deserve that the most. Let's bring our conversation to a close now with some one minute takeaways. Um, so if we if we go around and we talk about I'm really I'm going to start with you, Trevor, because I can't wait to hear about your out of the box thinking. So we've got to go there first. Um, let's have some sort of um, take takeaway moments for for, oh, okay. for the panel from the panel. Think, Thank you. I'm just touching back on what we talked about. I think one of the things that, that I work with our students do is say is to read the room. And I think that that is something. And we also talk about notion of transitioning, the fact that they're not going to be that teaching assistant with that teacher, with that learner forever. So it's about managing the learner's expectations as well uh, and that sort of process. So I think it's very much about them developing their own understanding and I, I just call I'd call it reading the room it's basically should I intervene should I not intervene should I step back and it's about making that professional decision but I think that's the other thing we have to to think about is too often is I worked in um, FE colleges for, for a number of years working with learning support workers and we had a number of what we call sort of some learning support workers which had very much the charity model I've been put here because I am here to help you yeah, and that took quite a lot of effort to 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 remove them to actually say let the let the young the young person take ownership of that. You are not here to do it for them. So I think I think one of the the bits that I I think I think other box is basically we need to have some kind of career structure and CPG training that is enhanced. So we do a lot of that. We do a lot of so bespoke. So quite often we will say if you're going to go for something which is a CPG, it needs to be accredited. It needs to be something of value that the person can take away with them um, with that process. And I just said, and then my question is, should, should teachers do all the teaching? You know, so if we take the model of, again, going back to, to FE, then we have the FE model where we have vocational instructors because are they experts in the field? But those vocational instructors in bricklaying or hairdressing or whatever are supported by a learning support worker. And that model that I work with in FA works really well. And that it does give you that that sort of relationship, but also that, that skills and, and expertise. And I just think I think the other bit is that devolve it back to schools. Let schools have the money that they are in the know, they know their staff, they know the students, for goodness sake, let's devolve the money back to them so that they make the decisions. And that might be changing the curriculum, that might be employing more support work, because it might be employing less teaching. Does that make sense? So it's about make them the experts, because they are the context knowledge person, rather than just say, well, you've got this money coming through. 
you know, and then we get we avoid this. We can't have SEN learners in our school because it's too costly or we have to balance the books. Or what we do is we go to the local authority and say, whatever, we need more money or there's tribunal there. So we'll go to a specialist school that costs 45,000 pounds. So it's more money. It's, it's that sort of revolving thing. But I think the message out of the box is, for goodness sake, let the organisation take the initiative within that process. They're the experts. Fantastic. So listen to the experts, listen yeah. to the professionals. Take ownership, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Wise words, Trevor. Thank you. Stuart, yeah. I'm going to come straight to you um, on, the, on the back of that, really. As a head teacher, look, listening to everything, appreciating and acknowledging that the significance and the value of the teaching assistant, which you, you have, you've articulated so well and so passionately. What's your one minute takeaway? Well, uh, yeah, thanks for putting me straight after Trevor, what he's just said, which is very inspirational. Thanks very much for that. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk in complete simplistic terms. So, so my model, and I say this to everybody and I, uh, you know, I bore people and they laugh at me when I sort of say this. I say schools and primary schools are, 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 are very simple. We overcomplicate things. The biggest difference we're going to make for children what you know whatever level they're working at whatever their need is is by getting them in school let's say we have you know and putting them in front of fantastic teaching staff whether they're teachers and teaching assistants uh, and having a curriculum which they love and engage with um, and and get the most out of that's that actually isn't too complicated for that what we what we need to make sure that we do is make sure that teaching assistants are seen as the integral part of that um, in in the classroom on a on a daily basis. Um, yeah, and I'll leave it there. Thank you. No, thank you. And equally inspirational. So thank you, Stuart. I'm going to come now um, to Lindy, I think. Lindy, if I can come to you because we've we've heard a lot from a parent perspective and, and that's fantastic. You also work in in a educational environment, so you're working in FE. So I know you're giving us a one minute takeaway, but I would like you to obviously put that personal perspective on. But I'm, I'm mindful to hear as well um, your your sort of perspective as somebody who works with somebody in that learning support role. Um, so maybe you could weave that into your one minute takeaway. Sorry, Lindy. <laughs> Thanks, Janet. <laughs> yeah, it's the making sure, as we've said all the way around this, it is the person centred practice. It's making sure the child is at the heart of everything. The young learner is at the heart of everything. And the only way we can do that is respecting that individual as a unique human being. And to do that effectively within the classroom, it's working with our LSAs, our TAs, our teaching assistants, and making sure it is, I think, Abby, you said a synergistic partnership within the classroom to make sure this can happen. Um, and I think it's really important we don't create a false economy where we think saving a couple of pounds in the schools now is gonna make the future cheaper when we end up with adults in the workplace, adults outside of education who need more support, who aren't able to be effectively employed or have a productive life of whatever that looks like, because we saved a couple of pounds. I know it's billions, but it's a couple of pounds in schools right now. Thank you. Thank you, Lindy. Some really, really insightful and, and profound things to be thinking about. Um, Abby. I think mine's probably a bit big and aspirational, <laughs> um, but I would really love to, I'd <laughs> love to see a real national commitment to CPD for teaching assistants and actually the recognition of teaching assistants as educational professionals. And I think there's a, a big commitment now to um, sort of early career framework for teachers and I would love to see a national commitment for CPD for teaching assistants and and being able to facilitate that being delivered through schools and actually supporting schools to really promote CPD to upskill and and sort of make sure our teaching assistants can be as effective as possible in classrooms. 
Thank you. And Eva. Yeah, um, wow, following everybody. <laughs> <laughs> uh, some amazing um, concepts and um, very difficult to follow on from that. But I think what I would like to choose is um, how senior leadership teams orchestrate the teacher TA relationship, how they actively promote that, how they build strength within their teams, develop this concept that we're all in this together. We're all going to be open minded. We're all going to be reflective. We're all going to be curious and explore what could potentially work well in our school um, and, and, and work that out together as a team. Um, and I think I'd just like to finish off with something that I, I know that Janet and I um, have spoken about before. It's TAs aren't psychic. You know, we have to include them in what's going on, the rationale behind our thinking. Um, otherwise, they, they can't just walk into a classroom and crack on as the experts. We've got to facilitate that. We've got to include them in, in all those lovely thought processes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And Angie, is there anything from, from listening to those to the wonderful conversation today and the one minute takeaways that have sort of harnessed and reined into to certain specifics? Anything that you would like to add? Oh, my. I is, just... is there anything left? Yeah, well, yeah, I mean, I mean, just first of all, thank you, because it, like I said before, each and every one of you have brought something different. But Abby, I want to go back to what you said about, you know, bringing that in par with teacher training and, and offering offering um, that CPG training in line with what's going on with uh, with teachers and, and, and recognising the skill set that we have in schools right now. And, and sometimes when I hear about budgets and everything like that, I think, well, come on, let's just take a look at what we have got. It's that glass half full rather than half empty. Here, <clears throat> here we have on our doorstep these wonderful, passionate individuals that so want to support those children and their families. Here they are on our doorstep. So let's we need to give them a voice. We need to let them speak out. We need to understand what their needs are so that we can tailor their CPD training around what's going on in their setting, in their sectors um, and 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 offer them the, the right type of support at the right time, because we have got that skill set already. We don't have to go out looking for these individuals. They are there and they're, they're passionate. They want to do that job. So just on top of everything that everybody has already said, you know, let's let's give them the um, the respect that they need. And, and hopefully from this, we can take that take that forward. Thank you, Janet. Thanks, Angie. And I, I just want to close the, um, the the panel by and and the discussion by actually thinking about what we've covered today. Because in this very sort of short session, we've covered an awful lot and we've discussed an awful lot and seen it from many perspectives. So we've looked at the parent perspective, we've looked at the lead in school perspective. We've looked at the, the views from a teacher. We've looked at the views um, from sort of the teaching assistant and, and, and what's represented through that network. And we've also looked at that very important academic perspective and, how, and what sort of training is happening, what's going on behind all of this to make things work. What came out and actually it was something that you said, Eva, that made me sort of it was it was done from a parent's perspective. They're always the strongest, aren't they? Because th this is what hits home. And it was when you said my children made it through. Mm. Our children sh and young people shouldn't be just making it through, should they? Mm. And, and, and this is, I think, what this is all about, that the people who are and I quote, making a difference, the glue in, in the school, the people who are challenging things that might not be right because they have the confidence to do so. And actually, it comes down to something quite simplistic. Stuart, you said so, um, that you were going to give a, a sort of simple summary, but actually, isn't that what it's all about in simple terms? This is about respecting each other and valuing each other. And I know that what we've talked about and that significance, that the importance of kindness, the knowledge to be able to apply that and the confidence to be able to do so um, in a competent manner is absolutely something that's shone through. We, I know that we've had comments in the chat 
uh, about something that's been not just the elephant in the room because I think the panel I think you addressed it um, in, in, in quite a, a sufficient way when we talk about the funding and we talk about um, underfunding and the sort of trying to balance the books when it's impossible and when things are becoming increasingly challenging on that front and that's something that that's um, that obviously we're not going to solve in a discussion, but something that is significant and something that needs to be addressed. Teaching assistants, I think we've well and truly put them on the map as professionals, professionals in their own right, that deserve, Abby, in your words, further investment through, through CPD that is meaningful, purposeful, accredited, Trevor. So all of those things um, that will enable, which is, is some of, one of the, the words that was used right at the very beginning, will enable the the whole, the whole uh, school approach, that teaching assistant who is feeling that confidence to go further and to actually not feel as though they're underachieving teachers, but to recognize and truly believe in themselves as specialists for the work that they do. Panel, thank you so, so much for your time and your contributions. And thank you to everybody who's tuned in to listen. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.